Hey there, welcome to my channel. My name is Leah and today it is time for another Get Ready With Murder. This is a weekly, well supposed to be weekly, true crime series that I do on my channel in which I will do a face of makeup and tell you a true crime story. Today we are going to talk about Richard Chase, the Vampire of Sacramento. Okay, so we're talking about Richard Chase today. Um, he was born in 1950 to a very, 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 very strict um, and controlling family. So that, coupled with probably some already existing mental illness, um, led to him exhibiting some pretty classic signs of somebody who was going to become later violent in his life. Specifically by the age of 10, he showed all of the three factors in the McDonald triad. So the McDonald triad is an indicator of somebody or three things that kind of happen in somebody's life that shows that they'll probably be violent <clears throat> later on in their life. Um, it's also called the sociopath triad, I think, and then the killer triad. Um, but the three main things are bedwetting, arson, and violence towards animals. Um, so by the age of 10, he exhibited all of those signs. Um, eventually, before he was a full-on teenager, he became dependent on alcohol. By the time he was a teenager, he started using other substances and abusing them as well. Eventually, he started having delusions and that led to his father actually um, kicking him out of the house. So he moved into his own apartment where he was free to kill all the little animals he wanted and then just straight up eat them raw. How he didn't die from like some crazy raw dead cat disease, I have no idea. By the time he was 25, he went to a psychiatric facility. Um, while he was there, he was given, you know, pretty heavy drugs. This was the 70s, so um, mental health practices are not at all what they are today. Granted, they were miles ahead of what they were before, um, but he was given antipsychotics and antischizophrenic drugs while he was there, um, which is something that you need to continue if you're going to maintain mental health. But while he was institutionalized, he still continued to kill small animals while he was there. Um, but after a while, they still released him and actually stopped his antipsychotics. Also, while he was institutionalized, he developed or I guess probably grew a huge fascination with blood. Apparently he would try to like get blood out of the therapy dogs with syringes. He'd killed a few birds and just drink the blood out of their little birdie bodies. Um, so he just had this weird fixation on blood. Um, and by the time he was released from the psychiatric facility, his mom helped him get an apartment. He got a couple of roommates, the roommates moved out, and he was on his own again. <laughs> um, a few years after he was released, he was found in his neighborhood covered in blood and screaming um so of course the police were called and they found out that it was cow's blood because he had a big bucket of said cow's blood just in his truck up to this point he hadn't harmed any humans um, but he had also grown a fascination with handguns so he had a 22 caliber handgun that in 1977 so he was 27 um, he fired off in somebody's kitchen um, nobody was hurt but he says that sparked something in him and what that sparked was mm, drive-by shootings so he killed a man by the name of Ambrose Griffin just completely randomly in a drive-by shooting with a handgun and after that, he started breaking into homes, stealing, vandalizing, um, and what's been known as generally terrorizing behavior. And here's where things start to go downhill real quick. In January of 1978, he randomly broke into the house of David and Teresa Wallen. Um, Teresa had gone to take out the garbage, left the back door open. Um, because, you know, it's your house, you think I'm just going to run out with the trash, everything's going to be cool. Um, so he ambushed her, shot her, and she died. He had sex with her body and drank blood from her organs and then bathed in the blood. Like I said, downhill real fast. And then two days later, he broke into another random house. A woman by the name of Evelyn Miroth was in this house babysitting for her two-year-old nephew. Her son was there and also a neighbor was visiting at the time. So the neighbor's name was Dan. He came in and he killed Dan and the children right away. 
Um, and then he killed Evelyn and drank blood from her neck area. And this one he actually took the um, Dan's body with him because he wanted to um, move from drinking blood to also being a little bit of a cannibal. So he ate some of the brain matter from that body and then left it in a nearby church. So that's pretty much it for all the really, really gruesome details. So that's pretty much it for all the really, really gruesome details. Um, you can tell now why he was called the Vampire of Sacramento because he, he did a lot of uh, blood drinking. Which still, I don't understand how he didn't get some crazy illnesses from that. So while Chase was a murderer who gave zero shits about who he killed, when, why, um, what he did to them, he also was not careful. He left a ton of evidence at all of the scenes um, and also took a bunch of trophies with him. So the police went to investigate at Evelyn's home because uh, there was a lot of commotion and a neighbor straight up went to the door, knocked on it, and that's what scared him away, but also left perfect shoe prints, perfect hand prints, and stuff all over the house. So it was not difficult to track him down. And by the time the police did track him down, um, they found in his apartment blood and body parts from the victims of these crimes, um, as well as, of course, the gun that he used to shoot most of them. And to further drive home the point that he was obsessed with blood, literally everything in his apartment had blood on it. Cooking utensils, blood, walls, blood, ceiling, blood, everywhere. Um, so he was messy on top of a cannibal. So, basically swimming in all of this evidence, he was arrested and put on trial for six counts of murder. His legal team did attempt to uh, avoid the death penalty by having him plead guilty to second degree murder, which would lead to a life sentence. And a lot of their case, I guess, really hinged on using his past history of mental illness. However, in 1980, the jury did find him guilty on all six counts of first degree murder and he was sentenced to death in the gas chamber. And while he was in prison waiting out his sentence, he did a few interviews with Robert Ressler. During these interviews, it showed he was extremely delusional and paranoid. He talked about Nazis and UFOs and that um, if he could get access to a radar gun, he could get one of the Nazi UFOs out of the sky and then they could be put on trial for the murders because he only killed to protect himself against them. And just about six months later, maybe a little bit more than that, he was found dead in his cell. Um, the autopsy showed that it was suicide via an overdose of prescription um, antidepressants that apparently he'd just been squirreling away for weeks. So that is the very strange and very disturbing case of Richard Chase, the Sacramento Vampire. Uh, I think there is a lot to unpack here as far as mental illness and how far we've come since then in treating it. And this was only like 40 years ago. So clearly we've come a long way since then, but I do also think that there is a long way to go in cases like these. I think there can definitely be quite a conversation regarding nature versus nurture. Like, was he determined to do this, you know, just because of the way his brain works from the get-go? Or did his environment have a lot to do with it as well with a abusive father? Um, and then just the topic of not receiving the appropriate care, although people knew that he had an issue um, and knew that he needed help. So I think there's a lot of factors that probably could have changed a lot of things knowing now what we do versus what we did then that probably would have saved some people's lives. So having said that, I'm going to leave a link down below that goes to Mental Health America. It's a charity that actually goes to helping a lot of people either um, get screened for mental health issues, find help that they need, um, low income people can help find doctors. They do a lot of really good in the mental illness field. Um, so if you feel inclined to possibly donate to them, I would very, very much recommend it. And with that, that is it for me today. Thank you guys so much for watching. I appreciate you coming every week. I know it's been kind of a weird 
upload schedule lately. My life's just been kind of up in the air. But I do have some really great news, so stay tuned for another video coming soon about that. Make sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already because I try to do Get Ready With Murders every single week. Um, but like I said, this last few weeks has been just kind of nuts. But I am going to get back into the schedule now. Um, so if you have any other stories you'd like to hear me talk about, definitely share those below. If not, make sure you hit that subscribe button so you're notified every time a new one goes up. All right, have a super great rest of your day and we'll see you in the next one. Bye, 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 bye.